Welcome to In the Landscape, a podcast on all things landscape design and care related with your hosts, Kate and Charles Sadler. Thank you for joining us on this episode of King Gardens In the Landscape. We're excited to be here in studio with our resident landscape designer, Charles Sadler. And I'm Kate Sadler, and we're looking forward to bringing you with us on today's journey, which will be all about boxwood, (laughs) (laughs) everybody's favorite ornamental hedge. So Charles, why boxwood? It is so versatile. It would be like the chicken of the the plant world. It's adapted to many climates from southern New England to Texas or parts of California, the Midwest. So it's very versatile. You can grow in lots of different climates. There's variety, so there's little tiny ones that are, you know, that would grow six to ten inches tall for a small hedge or in a window box. And then there are very tall ones that would grow into a large privacy hedge. It responds very well to pruning. It can become an architectural element because it can be shaped. It can be used for topiary. It's popular in during the seasonal holidays. It's popular as a as a cut ornament, as a in a wreath. So it has a long history. Different parts of the US, like if you're in the mid-Atlantic or in Virginia, there's like long histories of very old properties of boxwood with that are hundreds of years old. (laughs) So it's common here in the United States. Does it grow all over the US? It grows almost throughout the US. There'd be um, it grows from about beginning now we're gonna get like technical here the USDA hardiness zone. So there's in Canada, it's very similar uh, ranking. It goes from about zone four to zone nine. So in Northern New York, if you're in the, in the Midwest, it would be zone four. And there's parts of the US would be a little too cold. We're like zone three, let's say, which would be parts of Maine, parts of the upper Midwest, it would be too cold. And then zone nine goes to about Houston. When you get south, of Houston, or when you get to the tip of Florida or the, the California coast, then it's, it could be warmer than zone nine. So the summer temperatures would be a little too warm for it. So for those of us who don't currently have boxwood in our gardens, where might we have seen it? How might it be used? And what does the plant itself look like? There are different varieties, but if you think of, of your thumbnails, so like some of the varieties, the leaves are smaller, and that the size of those leaves might be like the size of your pinky nail. And then some of the larger varieties would be like your pointer finger or your thumbnail. That'd be the size of the leaf. It's somewhat shiny. It's used as a low hedge, which, which is called a parterre, which means like of the ground or on the ground. And so that could be used if you had an ornament, if you had a, a very beautiful vegetable garden, you might have a low, like you'd see, you'd see in colonial gardens, you have a low boxwood hedge around the, the vegetables and the herbs. So its origins actually in design was practical and that it has a bit of an odor. Some people like the smell, some people don't. It will repel animals to some extent. And so for instance, the deer don't like to eat it. So it's used as a low hedge. It can be used as a taller hedge, as a five or six foot hedge for privacy. It can be used as topiary. Topiary is simply when you start to shape a plant, that's topiary. It doesn't have to be in the shape of, a, of, a, of an elephant. <laughs> and so to establish rhythm in a garden, in a design sense, having two boxwood that, that flank a walk or boxwood at intervals of, let's say, 10 feet in groups that follow a walk. So it's, it's, it's used as an element, in a sense, to unify a garden. So it can be repeated. And we've talked on this podcast about having the right plant in the right place. Is this a plant that changes color for the seasons? Is it interested in being heavily watered? Does it tolerate sun or shade? What kind of growing conditions does it need? It's a personal requirement, you might call it. (laughs) So let's see. I need help remembering all those questions. As far as watering, that's in a way, it's, it's water requirements are its Achilles heel. So too much water, the roots will start to rot, and then we'll get different kinds of funguses. And so if the roots are too wet, irrigation or a wet site, 
it'll be reflected in the plant and you'll get whole branches that will die. When I plant it or transplant it, as, as we recently did some, plant, some transplanting work, I like to plant it a little bit high out of the ground. So that might be, if you want something from a nursery that was like a two gallon container, it's maybe just planted, say like about an inch out of the ground. And then you'd mound the soil around it. If it was a larger plant, maybe like a five foot tall boxwood, it might be planted as much as two or three inches out of the ground. So where the roots are, would be, it would look like it was planted too high. And you'd mound the soil away from that. And so that way, the roots aren't going to be sitting in water. So not too deep, not too much mulch. Not too much mulch will keep it wet. On some of the varieties, the leaf color will change as, as it gets cold. So as you get closer to winter. So like, for instance, the English boxwood, which is a dwarf, where the, the leaves are very small, like the size of your pinky nail, those leaves can even turn orange, like, like through the winter. So maybe not the whole plant, but if you get a cast of orange, some folks would think that was interesting. Other people would think the whole point is that it's evergreen and that you don't want it to turn color in the winter or that it looks like something's wrong. <laughs> so is there a variety that would stay greener than others that you know of? Uh, sure, like some of the, like the hybrids. So they're a cross between the American boxwood and Asian boxwood. Now, what about sun? You know, we were just actually, I was just reading up on that. So in full sun, they'll get quite dense. And then if they're too dense, boxwood, they're, they're very versatile. They can handle some shade up to full sun. They're probably happiest, I guess, with partial sun, where deep shade is going to get very thin Plant's going to get thin. There's not going to be full foliage. It could get diseases in the shade. In full sun, it's going to need more thinning. It'll get very dense, and then that could cause lack of air circulation. So tell us a little bit about the history of boxwood. Is it endemic to North America, or did it come to us from some other location? It's represented through various places throughout the world. And so there's instances of it, I believe, in South America in parts of Europe, Asia. Those are some of, of the places which they think that it originated. To my knowledge, there are not many cases of it living in the wild still. Now, there are some places in the world where it still is, which might even be Central Asia, near Russia. I'm not quite sure. It's a plant, because it, it has lots of history in garden design. And so the typology of the English garden, the French garden, when People from those countries of origin came to North America, Australia, South Africa, different places in the world. They brought those plants and the way of planting those, like the design typology of the low boxwood hedges, the topiary. Now, we did a talk once in Toronto for uh, someone who was a boxwood buff. And we did a little research in preparation for that and found that the boxwood has a history in art as well. So it has, as you can probably enumerate, actually very slow growing, dense hardwood branches internally, not really a trunk, right? Like a tree, but thick. Right. And though that wood has been used to create some of those really spectacular medieval miniatures. Mm -hmm. So we may link in the show notes to some images. There have been exhibits that have included many, several of these just exquisitely carved min wooden miniatures and, and also some woodwind instruments mm -hmm. have been carved from this, this special wood. So I don't think of it when I've seen it as a tree, so it wouldn't occur to me to harvest the wood, but obviously it can get quite large if given time to grow. And then that wood is really valuable for these special artistic projects. When you see old versions of it, I've been in locations in Virginia, at the University of Virginia, at a historic site, at another location that was a historic site where there were boxwood growing under larger shade trees, like the pecan tree, for instance, where it was in a fair amount of shade and it, it had become an open tree. It, would, like, it looked like a, like a small version of a magnolia where you have some cent several cent central trunks and you, you could see right through it. And there was, it was still evergreen, but it was, so I think in the wild, it would, it would exhibit that type of a habit, that type of a shape. 
And so it's neat to think of that history, that you know, boxwood that go back to early American history, even before that. There was an instance in some of the, the literature, which you can find when they're building the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., which presidents you know, have visited throughout history. Thomas Jefferson, that was a boxwood buff, a garden, you know, garden enthusiast, that he donated boxwood from some of his properties that were already probably hundreds of years old when he donated them to this National Cathedral. And I believe some of them may still be in existence. You went on a special trip to visit a boxwood producer in North Carolina? Let's see, there was the Boxwood, American Boxwood Society, and that was in, in Virginia. In near, Virginia. Near Charlottesville. And we have several images on our Instagram. If you'd like, you can follow us at King Garden Inc. on Instagram and take a look at many, 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 many boxwood images that we have from our work around the country visiting spectacular examples of boxwood gardens, cloud pruned boxwood. And if you'd like to, to follow us there, you can get a feel for how this is used. This particular special shrub is used throughout the landscapes that we have visited. So how do you source boxwood? Who grows it? Where do you buy it? To a good extent, your local nursery, wherever you might be located, ought to have plants that, that would grow in your region. So that's not always the case, but to a good extent, that's true. So a reputable nursery that has good sales help where you can ask questions, that's a resource. Your local botanic garden or arboretum, occasionally they would have, they might have classes, information, they might sell the plants themselves. So finding your local cooperative extension through the land-grant universities of Purdue, Clemson, University of Connecticut, Rutgers, Cornell, are some that come to mind. Those organizations ought to have good information on reputable distributors. And then if you were working with a professional, with a landscape designer, landscape architect, horticulturalist, they would source those plants from, from a wholesale distributor. And so making sure that those plants are sourced from reputable sources that are following best practices, that there's not any chance of boxwood blight, for instance, buying plants on sale or from a place that's not well known, you could be buying plants that, you know, that are sick. So tell us about the care of boxwood. Are they difficult to take care of or can the average home gardener take good care of his or her boxwood in a way that will, will bring out the best in that plant? I guess the first step would be, how is it going to be cared for in the location? So then you can make sure that what you're purchasing is the right size plant. So at most nurseries, or if you're working with a professional, you could say, well, we, you know, we would like a six foot privacy hedge here next to our patio. Finding the variety that would maintain that, like for instance, there's a variety called Green Mountain. So it's an upright growing, and it's also spread some. So if that plant's planted in the hedge, and the planted at a proper distance, intervals, the maintenance would be pretty low. Can you describe some of the other shapes that boxwood typically have? Because this is something we've seen before where someone will be trying to create that special parterre that you mentioned, where it's this really tight, you know, rectangular, angular hedge that we're sort of shearing and shaping and forcing the boxwood into. And you find it's a variety that is squat and wide and really right. wants to spread out. So what are some of the varieties and what are the shapes associated with those varieties? Oh, right. very good question. So the, the right plant in the right place, like there's a client in Connecticut that we work for that has a, a rose garden, which, which is made up of, it's bordered by, by boxwood, parterres. And I think the variety, it's a Korean variety, which is winter gem, which is very glossy and green in the winter, but it spreads quickly. And so it's, it's wide, it grows fast. And so it's a challenge to maintain it into a narrow hedge. Every few weeks, it's putting out more growth. If the correct variety is not, is not specified, then it can, the maintenance can be difficult. So what would be a good variety to use if you were trying to achieve that look with less intensive shaping? A popular variety is green velvet, which is widely used, widely available. That variety, if you planted it and you never pruned it, it would grow to about three or four feet tall and wide, roughly. 
And so with a low hedge, if you start out small, it would still be, you could maintain it to, let's say, 18 inches. But the key there would be just with starting with a small plant. It's tempting when working with a good budget to let's get the full-size plant. We want it to be two feet tall. We're going to start with a dense two-foot-tall plant. We're going to plant them close together. It tends to cause maintenance problems. Those roots of that plant were growing all by themselves with unlimited resources. And then now they're, the roots are, are smooshed together. Just a reminder to our listeners, we will put scientific names, the Latin names for the plants we discuss in each episode in the show notes so that you'll have an opportunity to follow that to, you know, request these specific varieties at your local nursery or to check up on which specific species we're talking about. We do know that's important. We'll often, for the sake of simplicity, use common names in, in the discussion in the podcast, but we know how important that can be for our gardening listeners. So do look there. So we're talking about the right plant in the right spot. And you mentioned how in full shade, the boxwood will get somewhat sparse in terms of foliage. And are there other ways to encourage full, lush, healthy growth? How do we go about maintaining our boxwood in a way that is promoting the health of the plant? Uh, thinning of the plant is an important component. But to go along with the, the question about the shade, so if you have your heart set on a boxwood garden and it's a little too shady, thinning the canopy or, or thinning the trees above it, that's often very reasonable to do. Or you can maintain the health of the tree still, but removing some of the branches. So the thinning of the boxwood, how that's done, what we've developed is just by touch, feeling the foliage, and then very quickly, immediately, you can feel where it's denser, where the, where the plant is more rigid, where there's more, more growth. And so once you feel that with sharp, sanitized pruners, the best practice is, is you reach right inside the plant and thin it. So the, the cut that you're thinning, ideally it's at a juncture where one branch meets another. You're cutting back to a juncture, like an intersection. Ideally... The cut is within inside the foliage. So once you make it, the, the remaining foliage more or less covers itself up and you're not able to see. Yeah, I can attest as someone who came into this business not with no horticultural background, the feel of the boxwood is really instructive. And it's something because it's so tactile that you pick up on quickly. And it's actually a very almost intimate way to get familiar with your plants and how they are growing and behaving and existing in your garden. So we suggest to everyone frequently pet your boxwood. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> you and the boxwood will benefit. You mentioned water. Do you need any specific irrigation? You know, for a larger planting, irrigation, or I always say irrigation, I mean, where there's a mechanical control or the irrigation lines are buried underground, there's drip irrigation. That's beneficial when the, when to hand water would be prohibitive, when uh, it's not able to be hand watered. But in reality, though, a newly planted boxwood, it's really only going to need irrigation for the first one year or so. So a system is the irrigation system is thousands of dollars, you know, generally to start with. And so we advocate hand watering, even if it's even if it's someone assisting you with that. It's really just for that first season. And then after that, if it's the right plant in the right place, the box would ought to be established. And unless there's a drought, it ought to be able to maintain itself with just normal rainfall. We've talked about soil being an important component. We think about watering as being kind of one size fits all, but the soil and the drainage actually makes a difference. So is there a preferred soil type for this type of plant? It likes well-drained soil. So that would mean... Just you can do a simple test, dig a hole that would be the size of a bucket, let's say, and then fill it with water and see how quickly it drains. If you come back in an hour or two and that water is still, it's still full of, that hole is still full of water, that would mean it's poor draining. And again, if you have your heart set on boxwood, despite the conditions, can you amend the soil to make it uh, certainly. hospitable? The, the, the boxwood roots are pretty shallow. So when you take it out of the pot or you transplant it, you can see I mean, the majority of them would be like six to 10 inches deep. 
So if you have poorly draining soil, if it's clay, that would be about the worst for boxwood. They don't like it wet, and the clay is going to hold the, hold the moisture. If it's very sandy, where you do your soil test, you put water in it, and it immediately drains out, that would be a little too dry. And so if you have a, an area where you're going to be planting boxwood, you could remove existing soil and add beneficial soil. If the soil is clay, even if you remove it, it's going to act like a bathtub. So you could add some drainage or drainage pipes that would take excess water away. So it's the boxwood likes evenly drained soil. We have some organic matter. Does it require much fertilizer? It doesn't. We have clients that love their boxwood and they think, you know, love is fertilizing, watering all the time. And so that actually can produce problems where there can be excessive growth. So when insects spot a plant that has beautiful, delicious green leaf, an excessive amount. So over fertilizing, over irrigating can cause, it can attract insects. And then it's going to necessitate more pruning. Having almost no irrigation after it's established, almost no fertilizer, unless the soil is, is you know, particularly poor. So you mentioned the thinning of the boxwood. That helps open it up to more sunlight, air circulation, helps reduce the impact of pests potentially, and gives it a springiness that you can actually feel. But you also mentioned that boxwood are great for shaping. So what and when and how do you go about shaping your boxwood? Would it be beginning of spring that you start getting the clippers out or Mm -hmm middle of summer? How how does that work? The timing of pruning in particular boxwood is very important. On the one hand, you can prune almost any time of the year where the temperatures are above freezing. To get the best results, if the boxwood is overgrown and you need to, you want to thin it or you want to reduce the size of it significantly, like more than a few inches, doing what's called dormant season pruning is very beneficial. So that would be if you're, let's say, temperate climate where you experience a winter and you have snow and it gets cold, that would be at the very end of winter. So before the plants have started to grow, so like in the Northeast, that would be like the end of March, beginning of April, the chance of snow is pretty much minimal. If you were in, let's say, Texas, that might be February. Or North Carolina, it might be April, or I'm sorry, uh, it might be March. So there's so the dormant season pruning is to, is to do excessive, if you're gonna do a lot of pruning and reduce the height of something or thin something quite a bit. So that's when the plant is asleep, basically. It's like operating on someone that's under anesthesia. So that's quite safe. Then during the season, so by doing that, the pruning during the growing season is minimized. So you don't have to do it as much shearing or shaping. The box would flush out new growth in the spring, whatever time the spring would be for for our listeners' garden. And then there's, a, so the leaves are, when they first emerge, are quite soft and they're generally a brighter green. So I like to wait until the leaves have hardened off, which they would turn from light green to darker green and they would get firmer and they would look the same as the, as the older leaves. So once that stopped, so that would be, let's say in the Northeast, that's like about June, in, in the warm, like in the in the warmer climate, it might be about May. So it's generally after spring, but before the full heat of the summer. And so at that point, it could be shaped for the summer, and and, it's, and it would make it's going to more or less maintain that shape through the summer. And then there could just be light touch touch up. Then uh, listeners that like the garden to be you know very preci- very precisely maintained. It could be pruned again at the end of summer. So before, after the heat of summer is over. And so in the Northeast, that would be like September is about the latest where you can safely prune the exterior. And I know in Texas, that would be like, or in, in, in other parts of the Southeast, that would be about October. So it could be shaped one more time, which would be about two months before the first frost. That way... The pruning is going to encourage new growth. The new growth comes out and it has time to harden off before the winter. Great. Now, winter can be harsher in some climates than in others. 
So what do those in really extreme winters do to protect their boxwood? Uh, good question. We were just looking up, actually, we have a visit to Chicago coming up. And so there's, there are varieties that are adapted to the winter. There's this one I think it's called, it was developed at the Chicago Botanic Garden. It's like called Chicago Green or something, something similar to that. There are varieties that might not need protection, such as all the Korean varieties, winter gem, winter green, that have larger, waxier leaves. So depending on one's winter, selecting the right variety for your, for your climate is important. There's some that are harder, hardier than others. Other approaches are spraying a protective waxy coating on, and there's different proprietary brands of that. And so that could be done, you could buy, it's called an anti-desiccant. So it's, it's a liquid form of wax where you're, you're spraying it on. And so that coating, it'll coat the leaves and it'll prevent wind burn. It'll prevent them from losing moisture. So then really like the second approach would be to, to physically wrap them, where it could be burlap or another material. And some properties we, where the wind burn's not an issue, but the snow load is where it's snow from just general snow or, or snow coming off the roof. And so in that case, using a, an organic cord, like a sisal or a hemp cord to wrap around the plant, will give it a little more structure. One of the things that we have observed at some of the places we visited is the impact of electric hedge trimmers used over and over and over again so that the the plant is never thinned, it's sheared quite a bit, and it's being sheared by electric clippers that kind of mash the, the end of the leaf and tear as opposed to cutting, and that can lead to browning. So we see a lot of this sort of brown looking edges that detract from the aesthetic that obviously people are going for when they plant an evergreen hedge. So tools are really important in this trade. And this kind of brings up another topic that we should address before we close, which is you mentioned something that might send chills down the spine of boxwood lovers everywhere, boxwood blight. So how do we maintain our tools and what tools do we select so that we are coming in with nice, clean, sharp cuts for the type of both thinning and shearing that you've described? Having top quality tools. And so those are made by all types of manufacturers, American, there's great Japanese brands, German brands, and throughout the world, there's, just, if there's high quality tools and having them well-maintained. So the garden shed or a bin in the garage <laughs> is a great place for rust and for the tools to get degraded. And so they're not as sharp. And so then the cuts are not as clean and then there's more chance and the plants don't heal as quickly. So having Having the, the tools well maintained sort of is the first step. So having a place that's dry, which maybe is not the garage or the tool shed. And after using, we always sanitize, which you could use a disinfectant spray like you would in your kitchen. So one of the latest thoughts is to use alcohol, so like, a, like a 70%, which I guess would be an isopropyl alcohol, that that helps prevent the spread of boxwood blight or other diseases. So what, even working within your garden, it's important if you're working in your side garden, you're pruning boxwood before you go to the backyard to prune more to sanitize it, just in case the plants in those areas. We often sanitize from plant to plant when we're working because our clients' gardens are so important to us to, to preserve. And even footwear can be protective, or you can insist that your landscape professionals use tools that you have on site so that they're never kind of trafficking in anything from anyone else's garden. It may sound extreme, but the impact of some of these spreading problems is becoming greater and greater for some of these species that we really love. It's worth it. Every garden can be a barrier against further spread of some of these invasive and, and destructive funguses and, and insects and, and such. So any other pests that are common to the boxwood that have simple treatments? I can think of those curling leaves that signify oh, right. what? So that's a sucking insect. So there's, there's psyllids, there's all different types where they're more or less, it's an insect that's like a mosquito. It's, it's sticking its, its needle, so to speak, into the leaf and taking out the liquid. So there's a, a variety I didn't mention 
which is similar to green velvet that's nice for hedges and lower plants, called Varder Valley. The Saunders Brothers Nursery that's in Virginia, that information is available online, of course. They're always developing more and more. The English boxwood is, but some growers are no longer propagating that. So that's famous as a low hedge, that very slow growing with very small leaves. So that, I guess the overall trend would be toward Asian boxwood, Japanese or Korean, that are more resistant to blight. And would you suggest a variety in one's own garden just to avoid a monoculture? Would that be helpful at all or even necessary? I would say no, that using the, the Korean or the Japanese versions of boxwood, that, that's probably, that probably is the safest. It doesn't look 100% like the more traditional, because the leaves are a little bigger and a little glossier, but the research tends, tends to suggest that that's a safer approach, that those, that those varieties are resistant to the more extreme weather, which could be hotter or colder, more rain, more drought, and all the different insects and blights. So for our listeners, if you happen to have a spe special love of boxwood as we do, if you have questions that we didn't cover in this episode, or suggestions, please email us at connect at kinggardeninc.com. And we look forward to hearing from you about anything that you would like to hear covered in future episodes. So any last thoughts on Boxwood before we wrap up? Our Boxwood page on our website, uh, there's some additional information that we, that we list, health resources for Boxwood. So usda.gov, this there's a National Arboretum that does lots of research in boxwood that's right outside of Washington, D.C. That's a good resource. In Europe, boxiscare.com, that's another resource. There's more pests and disease problems in Europe, so they have more resources. <laughs> and then the cooperative extension in your area, whatever that might be, is also a good resource. And you can reach out to us at kinggardeninc.com. That's our website. We often have tool tips. We have links to some of our videos demonstrating things like petting boxwood and reaching in to thin it out and shearing, of course. We have some more design ideas, ways to set up guidelines so that you can get things into the right shape and level. So there's a lot to cover in future episodes on how to get the great design aesthetic that we love from this shrub and other ornamentals. So I look forward to discussing them with you further and sharing them with our listeners. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye.